Hi, my name's Shad, and I'll be your teacher and guide for this lesson on operating systems. Most people know that a fast processor in a computer makes the computer fast. But did you know that it's just as important for the memory and how it's managed? In this video, we're going to look at the history and the innovations that people have made in making computers fast using just memory techniques. So this video is about memory management with operating systems. So in your computer, you're going to find the task manager shows you how much resources is being utilized in your computer. And an important part of that is the amount of memory. And so you can see in this computer, 85% of the memory is being consumed. And one computer program in particular is taking the space. You can see Visual Studio is quite a memory hog. Now, if you were in the old days, you would have had a system that managed memory quite differently than what happened in Windows and then in the most current version of Windows, which right now is Windows 11. There's dramatic improvements from the history of how computers, especially computers that are personal computers, have been designed. So way back in the old days, there was this concept of a single user memory system. So I mean, really old, like 1950s old, and then the first personal computers in the 1980s. So this is what it looked like when you bought a computer with Microsoft DOS on it. There was no Windows, but just as importantly, it was a single user memory process. So what does that look like? Well, we have memory, which is represented by this chip here. And suppose we had multiple programs that we wanted to run. How did you do it with a single user system? Well, you would put a process into memory and then when you wanted to use a second program, you had to evacuate the memory so that another one can come in. And so you can see the pattern here that three can go in after two is done and four cannot go into the memory and do any processing while three is action. So we need to have some kind of a dynamic system where we can put more than one computer program into memory because this is kind of a slow process. And also when you get to a problem like here with program number five, we're going to see that there is no way that we're going to put five into memory even if we clear out everything else. The program is physically bigger than the computer can handle. Now we've solved that and we can see that in later parts of this video of techniques to make virtual memory. But in the old days, a single user system had severe limitations. So single user systems are quite simple and they were effective for what they needed to do they do not require a large amount of resources. As a matter of fact, the early days of DOS, you could put the entire operating system on a floppy disk. But they were only for one program at a time, which was severely limiting. So we had some slowness and people just put up with it because that was a good system for the time. The next innovation that came along was called a fixed partition size, which allowed multiple programs to fit into memory at the same time, but it too had some limitations. So we would be able to put one process in, but while that process was there, we could also load a second program if there was sufficient space in the RAM. And so we could, in this case, we can put three and even four, which appears to be a small program. But of course, when you try to put the next item in, it just wouldn't fit and there was no vacancy. So if you filled up your memory, you were stuck and you couldn't run any more programs. You had to reboot your computer. And so shutting down each time that you wanted to free up the RAM is a very inefficient use of the program. So I'd like to show you a simulator of a memory management system. So this is the program that a student designed, I believe, that shows you how a memory manager worked in some of the older versions of operating systems. So I can put in a number here for the process size, which represents the amount of kilobytes required and then the uh, processing time is how long that process will live. So I'm going to use 90 and 90 for the two values. And you can see each time I add a new process, uh, the memory is slowly consumed. And you can see that it's consumed in pieces of size 90 kilobytes each. And so then the problem eventually arises that it's so fragmented that you can't put in another large chunk of a process. And so we have to either refresh the browser, which is like rebooting the computer, or just continue to use smaller and smaller fragments. So this is an older system design, and it's a great program to illustrate how memory management looks 
but I wouldn't want to have this for my modern operating system on my computer today. So this system has the advantage of letting multiple applications run, but we are not dynamic, which means we can't readjust the size of the uh, blocks after they've been used, and so it was somewhat limited. The next innovation was called dynamic, but with continuous blocks, and so what does that look like? So once again, we have RAM and we have programs. We can load them in one at a time, and we can consume all of the memory up to the very last byte. And so in this case, you can see four programs are running. So when we try to put the fifth one in, it doesn't work. But we're not going to put up the no vacancy sign here. If we clear out a program, there's a possibility that this next number five will fit. It doesn't fit, so we have to wait till the next process is finished. And when those two are out of the way, then process five is free to move in and occupy the space. However, notice the gap. That gap is still there. And so we can't put number six in, obviously, because it's too big. So six cannot fit between five and three, nor can it fit at the end. And so six is pretty much out of luck until three or five finish up their job. Now, this here can allow you to use multiple apps. It is dynamic, which means that you can, you know, free up the space, that it's contiguous. But then there is a, still that problem of the limited program size. If your program is bigger than the amount of RAM, it still will not run. So we still need a better solution. And along comes the idea of virtual memory. So how does virtual memory work? So instead of using a program in its entirety, we split it up into slices. And so those slices we're going to call pages. So a page is a set amount of memory. So you can configure that in your operating system and certain page sizes work better than others. Your page frames then are the segments in your memory. So think of taking a large parking lot and painting lines on it and pretending that every vehicle in the world is the exact same size. That would be kind of like organizing your program and you split it up into car sized pieces so that you can park them. And so you can put all of your memory then in the same segments. Now you don't have to put them in sequence because if you decide that you're going to put them in any in the next available slots, then you have a much more efficient way to reutilize those empty parking places. To make that happen, we have to have what's called a page table, a page index. And so the page numbers are listed along with the memory address where that uh, place has been stored. And so that is a way to make your virtual memory work. Now to make that work, you have to have a memory map. And the nice thing about the memory map is that it allows you to actually have more virtual memory than physically is on your computer. So your computer memory has a address space. So zero would be the lowest address and then some number, the maximum amount of memory that's in the computer would be your maximum high memory value. However, with virtual memory, we can extend that to a huge number. And so you have to just map the parts that are actually in use with the pieces that actually can be put into RAM. And so there's this mapping process that goes on. And so virtual memory allows you to have programs that are actually larger than the RAM and they can still operate correctly. So this brings up another concept of operating systems. And the idea of having a 32-bit operating system versus a 64-bit operating system is very important when it comes to memory management. So first of all, what is a 8-bit or 16-bit kind of operating system? So think of the chips or the little integrated circuits that you may have seen that have pins, and those pins are numbered. So an 8-bit integrated circuit would have 8 pins, a 16-bit would have 16 pins and 32 pins and 64 pins and so on. And so when you have a CPU that has more bits, it means you have higher throughput. If you can check on your computer with the system information, you can see what kind of an operating system you have installed. So back in the days of Windows 7, there were two different kind of operating systems that were common. There was a 32-bit system and there was a 64-bit system. Now they both looked identical, the desktops were indistinguishable, but the performance was much better with the 64-bit. Why is that? Well, one of the issues is that you can have more throughput when you have more wires. So it's just like a highway with more lanes in it, has a higher capacity to carry more cars. Also, you can use higher values when it comes to memory. 
And that's why 32-bit versus 64-bit is such a critical concept when it comes to memory management. So let's talk about the numbers that you can represent using bits. So if you have a 1-bit number, you have two combinations, 0 or 1. A 2-bit number allows you to count up to 4. A 3-bit number allows you to count to a maximum number of 8. And 4 bits allow you to count all the way up to 16. So that is binary counting. Now what if you have 32 bits? How high can you count with a 32-bit number? Well, you can count quite high. At least it sounds high. The number actually is 4 gigabytes when it comes to how high you can count. And so a 32-bit processor is only able to have an address space of 4 gigabytes. Now, at one time, 4 gigabytes seemed like a lot for a PC to have for memory. And of course, nowadays, uh, nobody has 4. So 64-bit processors allow you to access a huge amount of space. As you can see in this chart, it says 16 exabytes, which I think is probably more data than you can find in the world today on the Internet. So 64 bits is much larger than 32 bits, not by doubling, but by an exponential amount. And so the amount of virtual memory that a computer system can access is important by the number of bits that an operating system is measured by. Let's take a look at the processors that Intel has made. So in 1971, they had a 4-bit processor. Quickly, they came out with an 8-bit processor, which was the 88, which was one of their most successful. The 8086, of course, was one that is uh, still called the 86 architecture used today. And then we have the 386, which was the first 32-bit processor. And then in 2004, they introduced a 64-bit processor. When will they come out with a 128 processor? I don't know. Maybe it'll not even be in your lifetime. But we do have this growth of capacity of how many bits a processor can access. By the way, Intel is not the only processing company in the world. 1975 was the first 64-bit processor with the Cray-1 supercomputer. Another trick that came out, I think, in Windows 7 or Vista or sometime was this thing called ReadyBoost. If you were to plug in a USB stick into your computer, you would be presented with this autoplay option, and at the very bottom was the ability to speed up your system. Now, this is sim simply virtual memory that was allowed to expand the amount of memory that your computer could access. And so you could swap out things to your USB stick, and that would essentially give you more RAM, even though the USB stick was likely many, many times slower than the original RAM. And so that would be somewhat effective. Now, this virtual memory system allows you to run multiple apps, and the advantage is that it's dynamic again, and you can have programs that are actually far exceeding the amount of memory that's on the computer. So the way that works is that you would have a partial piece of the, of the program in memory at any one time. So that process of loading only a partial part of a program is called on-demand paging. So if we were to have a computer system again with a piece of program that is trying to load into RAM, we would split it up into pages. Now, what happens if you don't need all of those? So the program executes, and we only need one, uh, one, five, and six for our pages. And so we can load those three into memory and leave the others on the hard drive. So there's no sense in loading them into RAM if we're not going to need them. And so we would call that on-demand paging. So there is now a problem to say which pages do we want to put into memory and which piece, pieces do we want to keep there. So that's called your page replacement. And so we have a policy in place where you can say first in, first out, or la least recently used, the least frequently used, or the most recently used. So first of all, if we have pages in memory where the first in, first out rule occurs, then the one that came in first, which is page number one, that has to be uh, excluded first, and then everyone kind of moves over and we put in the new piece. So first in, first out. The next item is the rule called least recently used rule. So if we were to have some kind of a timer on each page, and we were to notice that uh, memory uh, page number three has been in memory a long time, we need to put five in. So we're going to elect three then to be booted. So three gets excluded, and then we put five into its place. So that is the least recently used rule. 
Now then there's also the fre least frequently used rule. So we could look at our memory and instead of putting a timer on it, now we count how many times it's been accessed, either read or written to. And so you can see that we have number two here. It stands out as hardly ever used. It was only accessed twice. So if we need to put five in now, we're going to elect number two to be booted, and then we'll put five into his place. Now how about the most recently used rule? So this one seems a little counterintuitive, but we would do the opposite of the least recently used. So we look at the piece of memory that was most recently used, and we elect that one to be kicked out. And so we throw out number four, and then five gets into his place. Now that would occur when you're trying to read through a long list of things, and sometimes this actually is more efficient than the other routines. Finally, there's one item called segments. So pages that we've assumed right now are all the same length. Now we can also split up a program by segments. So what's a segment? So a segment is essentially one of the methods that's in your class. You can think of it as a code chunk that is a logical unit. And so some segments are bigger than others and we can split the pages up into variable sizes. So obviously that's not as easy to work with if you don't have a uniform size, but you can have more um, granularity as far as security and things like that. So in the reality, we get a combination of the two. Now the last problem is you can only get this benefit of swapping up into a certain point where it becomes inefficient. So you've all had a computer before that seems to just slow down after you load so many programs into it. That's because your RAM is being swapped out from the hard drive into memory and then back out again. And you get to a certain point that it's called thrashing. And so the only solution for this is either to purchase more memory and expand your computer or to close programs. So thrashing is kind of the limit that is practical for how much you can do with multi-programming. So there are essentially five things that we've done here with memory management. If this is interesting to you, make sure that you take a look at the next video, which is about what the jobs of an operating system are. If you like this, please make sure that you touch that subscribe button and come back, or you can join me in class where I teach at Grand Canyon University with software development. Thanks for showing up, and I'll see you in the next video.